Hi, my name is Rick, and this is the first of a series of video tutorials where I will show you how to make old-school classic vector-based arcade games targeting WebAssembly. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to make simple vector animations using AssemblyScript and the Vector Engine module. If you're already a web developer who writes in TypeScript or JavaScript, AssemblyScript is going to feel super familiar to you. The designers of AssemblyScript wanted to create a language that is very similar to TypeScript, but with WebAssembly as a compilation target. WebAssembly is a low-level binary format that has the potential to create super-fast web applications. Be aware that just writing a game in AssemblyScript does not necessarily mean that it will run faster than equivalent JavaScript. You have to actually design your app for performance. AssemblyScript and WebAssembly gives you the potential to write faster apps, but keep in mind, JavaScript is a highly optimized scripting engine that has had decades of performance improvements. If you want your WebAssembly apps to outperform JavaScript in any significant way, you're going to need to put some thought and effort into it. This tutorial series is not going to focus on optimization, just the basics. I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code for this tutorial, but that is not a requirement. You will need to have Node.js installed in order to compile AssemblyScript. If you don't have Node.js installed already, you can download it from nodejs.org and install it. If you would also like to use Visual Studio Code, but don't have it installed, please go to code.visualstudio.com download, then download and install it. When you have Node installed, you can install AssemblyScript using the NPM Node Package Manager. AssemblyScript was designed for web developers and has a web-first ethos. You can install AssemblyScript just like any other NPM package. You probably want to install it globally so that you can use the compiler from any project. Once you have AssemblyScript installed, you can install my Vector Engine NPM package. Now that we have Vector Engine installed, we need to create an HTML file to contain our canvas and run our WebAssembly binary. I'm going to do that in an SRC directory. WebAssembly doesn't have an HTML tag. You'll need to run some JavaScript code to load and execute your WebAssembly binary. I'll save that for a later tutorial. Vector Engine has its own JavaScript code that sets up and runs your WebAssembly module. Once you have the HTML file, add the following code. This is a pretty minimal bit of HTML. We just have our style here, followed by a body tag. We've included a canvas with an ID of CNVS. I need to import the run vector game function from my vector engine module. If you're building with Rollup or Webpack, you'll want to download this file or grab it out of the node modules folder. To keep this tutorial simple, I won't be using Rollup or Webpack. I'll just import this from unpackage.com. After importing the function run vector game, we're going to need to call it, passing in the ID of our canvas, the name of our WASM file we'll be compiling later, and the name of the function we want called every time the frame is rendered. Let's create a file called hello-world.ts. Like TypeScript, AssemblyScript uses the .ts extension. This lets it piggyback on top of a lot of the language development tools already written for TypeScript. The first thing we'll do in our assembly script is import the display string class and the render loop function from Vector Engine. Display string is a little class that allows you to display vectorized strings to your HTML canvas. The render loop function renders a static array of XY coordinate pairs to the canvas as a line loop. Before I show you the code that we'll use to create a string and display it to the canvas, let me take a moment to briefly explain the WebGL 2D coordinate system. Unlike in Canvas 2D, WebGL puts 0, 0 in the dead center of your canvas coordinates. The top of your canvas has a Y value equal to 1.0. The bottom of your canvas has a Y value equal to negative 1.0. The far right side of the canvas has an X value equal to 1.0. The far left side of the canvas has an X value equal to negative 1.0. If you're familiar with Canvas 2D, the top left corner of your canvas has the 0, 0 coordinate, and the X value gets greater as you go to the right, and the Y value gets greater as you go down. WebGL is a little more intuitive, in my opinion. So in WebGL, if you wanted to draw something that was halfway between center and the very top of the screen, that would have a Y value equal to 0.5. So, if you look at these coordinates, this would be 0, 0. If you stay in the center for x and go up a little bit on the y, say right here, this would be y equals 0 0.1 with x equals 0, 0.0. 
This is y equals 0 0.2, y equals 0 0.3, y equals 0 0.4, y equals 0 0.5, and it just goes up from there until you get to 1.0. Same thing here. It works the same way for the x-axis. This is y equals 0, 0.0 all the way across, obviously. As you increase the value of x, you go to the right. As you decrease the value of x, you go to the left. When you hit 1.0, you're all the way over. So this would be x equals 0, 0.0 x equals 0 0.1, x equals 0 0.2, x equals 0 0.3, and so on. Now that we know how the Canvas coordinate system works for WebGL, let's create a display string object. You may not be familiar with F32s and U32s. This F32 is a 32-bit floating point number. The number type in TypeScript is an F64. It's a 64-bit floating point number. F32s have significantly less precision than an F64. The primary difference between a 32-bit floating point number and a 64-bit floating point number is the number of significant digits they can hold. An F32 can have about six or seven significant digits. Saying six or seven is an approximation, of course, because significant digits are decimal, and really an F32 has significant bits. An F64 has somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or 16 significant digits. You may ask yourself, why would I use an F32 when I could use an F64? Well, two reasons. Number one, they execute a little bit faster, somewhere in the order of 10%. They also only take up half as much space. So if you only need about six or seven significant digits in your number, and when you're talking about games, that's usually the case, F32s work perfectly well. A U32 is a 32-bit unsigned integer. 32-bit unsigned numbers can represent any positive number from 0 to 4 billion something. We're going to use 32-bit unsigned integers for the colors in Vector Engine. We can break these up into red, green, blue, and alpha components. FF is 255 if you're converting from hexadecimal into a decimal. You don't need to know all of that right now, just know that this number here is yellow. We're going to pass in the string we want to display, the x and y coordinates, the scale, which is the size, and the color. Now, you'll notice up here I used a 0 0.4 as the scale. How did I come up with that number? Well, when I created the display strings, a value of 1.0 in the scale would make each character in the string take up roughly the entire canvas. So, having a scale size of 0 0.04 makes each character in the string take up somewhere in the neighborhood of 4% of the size of the canvas. Now that we have our Hello World object that we created from the display string class, we're going to need to render that in the game loop. Now, I'm kind of old school. Uh, when I started writing games, they always had a game loop. A game loop was basically an infinite loop that did all of the renderings uh, in OpenGL or DirectX. So it would sit there in a loop that went on until you exited the application. Now, technically speaking, this isn't a game loop anymore. This function gets called on the request animation frame event from JavaScript. I'm still going to call it a game loop, just because that's how I usually refer to this. We called it game loop, and we pass in a delta, which is an i32. And it returns void. Okay. And all we need to do right now in this is hello world dot render. That should render our display string object with all of the parameters we passed in. Now we can compile the hello world dot ts using the ASC compiler command. ASC hello world dot ts dash dash import memory. When you use Vector Engine, you need to use the import memory flag. You have to pass in the import memory flag because Vector Engine declares its memory inside of the JavaScript. And then we tell it to output hello world dot wasm. That's the dash o flag is the output. Now we're almost ready to run our application, but there's another catch. The dot wasm files have to be served through a web server. You cannot open an index HTML using the file system and expect it to run. It just won't execute. So 
In order to run this application, we're going to need to create a little web server. I'm not going to go into detail about how to create a little static web server. I'm just going to create one in Express very quickly. So here's the code to a simple static Express web server. From the main directory in my project, I'm going to run node server.js. And now I have a web server listening on port 8080. Now this web server is pointed at the source directory, so I should be able to put in localhost 8080 and pull up the application. So now we can bring up localhost 8080 in our web browser, and it says hello vector engine. Well, that's interesting and all, but why don't we actually display something other than text? I mean, you could display text anywhere, right? So let's go change our code. Let's change our code so we could display a little heart to go along with this vector engine text. So let's go back to our hello world.ts file. And we will add a little static array of floating point variables called heart loop. These are XY pairs for a line loop that we're going to render. In the array, here's the first point of the line, here's the second, and the third, and all the way down. And then inside of our game loop, we're going to have to add some code that actually renders that line loop. It has a scale of 0.3 meaning it should take up somewhere around 30% of the screen. It has an X value of 0.0, .0 meaning it should be centered along the X coordinate. It has a Y value of negative 0.2, meaning it should be down a little from the center. It has no rotation and it's going to have a red color. And then we render this loop. So let's recompile ASC hello world.ts dash dash import memory dash o hello world dot wasm. Now if we go back to our web page and refresh, we have a nice little heart there. Okay, so how did I get all of these XY coordinates for the heart? Well, I have this little tool on wasmbook.com called lines. wasmbook.com slash lines. And this just lets you draw a little loop here. And it gives you this, it outputs this static array, which was the array that I used when I drew, when I bothered to draw a heart. So let's just say I take this array and I replace our nice little heart here with that static array. And I recompile, let's see what that gives us. Yeah, okay, the heart was better. So. I'm going to pull this out and put the heart back in. Just for fun, I'll recompile so I don't have that ugly thing hanging out. And if we refresh, we get our heart back. Well, you know, drawing static images is all fine and good, but if you're writing a game, you need to animate stuff. So. How do we go about animating things? Well, luckily we have this delta variable that's being passed. Delta is the number of milliseconds since the previous render. So we can use that to time animations. And what we will do is we will add a global time change variable, because when you're animating, you need to, you need to keep track of time. And then in every loop, we will add to that time change the value of delta, we have to convert it to a floating point 32, because this, this is a floating point number here. So we convert it to a float 32, and then we divide it by 1,000. And that way, time change will increase by a fraction of a second instead of milliseconds. That'll just make it easier to time things like a sine wave growth pattern. Now, we had scale set to a fixed point 3, but instead what we could do so we could have scale change over time based on a sine wave over the number of seconds that have passed. This may look a little complicated, but really it's this sine wave that matters. The, you know, multiplying it by a value and adding this, this was just to get something that looked normal. So, you know, just for fun, I'm going to make this extra simple. I'm going to cut all that extra stuff out and use a pure sine wave. So I recompile and let's see what that looks like. Whoa, it gets really big. See, because it shoots way up. Oh, and then it goes negative. That's right, because the sine waves go negative. You know, they go from one to negative one. So notice when it gets all the way up to one, it looks like it takes up roughly the whole screen. And then when it goes to negative one, it like inverts. 
So what we'll do is we'll switch it back to what it was intended to be, which here, you know, I'm just modifying the time change so that it has a faster pace because, you know, this thing is like beating it, it since it's since it's going over two pi, you know, since the sine wave goes from like zero to two pi, um, it's basically taking six seconds to run the whole loop. Well, we don't want that. We need it to take, you know, we need it to beat multiple times a second. So we're multiplying the time change by 18. And then we're adding one because we don't want, we don't want it to go negative. And then I'm dividing this whole thing by 50 because we don't want the heart to be this big. Look, it's taking up the whole thing. So we want it to take up a much smaller percentage. And then, you know, I'm adding 0.2 to the whole thing because I want it to have like a minimum size. So that's why this function is what it is. I mean, the bottom line is it's all based off of the sine wave. So if I recompile, and now we have a nice little beating heart. Okay, so that's about it. Um, if you want to see more tutorials, my website is wasmbook.com. I'm going to be adding more. I've got another tutorial out here for like using classes to package up your display loops. If you need to contact me, you can do so through social media. I have links on wasmbook.com to my Twitter, LinkedIn page, and the Assembly Script Discord where I hang out all the time. I hope you like this tutorial, and hopefully I'll be doing more soon.